There's a, um, an old story about a, a couple of adults that are sitting on a park bench and they're watching kids play in the sandbox nearby and one of the kids starts throwing sand and they start, you know, fighting about a toy or something and one adult gets up to go, you know, fix the problem. And the other one says, oh, you know, let's wait a second, let's see what happens. And of course, in, in short order, the kids have made friends again and they're playing together again, you know, as kids do, right? They seem to move through it pretty quickly. And so the adult that wanted to get up and fix it says, how is it that kids move through stuff so quickly? We seem to have a really hard time with that. And the other one says, you know, I think it's because they always choose being happy and having fun over being right. As my dad would have said, isn't that the truth? <laughs> so getting back to that sort of, you know, that, that's kind of how we come in, right? That's our natural way of working through stuff. And so we can return to these very simple ways that, that are, are innate to us of working through our, our conflicts and our difficulties. We're in the third week of our series, Braving the Wilderness. Actually, the series is called Sovereign Belonging, but it's based on the book, Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown, and the subtitle is The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone. So that's really what we're after in understanding as we move through the, this work, and today's title is Speak Truth to Hui. <laughs> Hui, and you're saying now, who is Hui? Well, I asked myself the same thing, and then by bizarre free association, Huey, Dewey, and Louie came to mind. <laughs> and then I started wondering, now were those really Donald's kids? Or because he was Uncle Donald, did he adopt the kids? And so I needed to get to the truth, right? So I got on the internet and I started Googling. You know, can't read everything, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. So I looked at a couple of different sources. And it got really confusing. It turns out that like Dumbella, or then sometimes she was called Della, sometimes identified as Donald's sister, and sometimes his cousin, had sent a note with these three little angelic boys, she said, and, and said, uh, somebody lit a firecracker under their father's chair, and he's gone to the hospital, and so here, Uncle Donald, here's the kids to take care of while he, <laughs> he gets restored, you know? So why am I taking us on this crazy journey? Because that's kind of how it feels right here. I'm talking about a pretend, right? A cartoon. And it's like trying to weed through all this stuff to get to the truth. Do you ever feel that way in our world today? Yeah, there's a lot of Huey out there. This is my euphemism for the day. Brene just goes straight for it and calls it BS. But yeah, <laughs> I thought it's church. I should probably stick with something a little softer. So here's a difference between truth and lies and Huey. <laughs> truth, we know what truth, truth is truth, right? Truth in the worldly sense, in the, in the relative truth, is just based on facts, right? It's getting to the facts. What's the facts of the situation? In, in the absolute truth, we're talking a little bit more about spiritual truth, a deeper truth. And we're working on both levels, right? We're in the world, we're not of it, but we're in the world. And so that's why this work is so practical, right? To take our spiritual understandings and, and put it into the world in a practical way, to deal with the things that are going on in our world from a spiritual lens, to speak truth to this hooey, you know? But we have to understand what it is. So, so there's truth and lies are actually direction, you know, opposed to truth. It's an intentional opposition to truth, right? Intentional opposition to the facts, let's put it that way. Hui, on the other hand, is a lot harder to deal with because it's that gray area. You know, this is the place where stories are made up. This is that whole fake news thing, right? This is just where, where we've come to a point where there's so much of that kind of stuff out there and then we're all expected to weigh in on every, you know, topic in the world. Have you noticed that? Everybody wants to know what you think about what happened in Japan last week and you're like, I don't know, I have no idea. And so we tend to think, well, what would my people think? right? How would my people respond? So then we get into these ideological bunkers that Brene talks about, this sorting, and we kind of speak from the, the we speak space. 
it's okay to say, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay to say, I don't have enough information, right? To, to weigh in on that topic. And so that's part of how we cut through some of this. Um, Professor Harry Frankfurt wrote a slim volume on BS, which I find really funny that it was a slim volume. <laughs> <laughs> and in it, he tries to, to get to the, you know, the, the crux of the matter, which he says we've become so skeptical of everything because there's so much of this kind of made up stories out there. And so it's kind of like we get to the point, we sort of, as Dr. Brown says, throw up our arms and say, whatever, I, can't, I don't know what the truth is, so my opinion just makes it so, you know? <laughs> that, that's the truth now, that's what I'm going with. We kind of give up on the notion that there is observable knowledge, that there is a way to effectively problem solve together. But we can't give up, right? <laughs> we can't give up because there is spiritual truth that needs to be known, because we have to be able to work together both in a worldly sense to solve problems, but also to bring forth a spiritual truth that can really bring resounding resolutions, ways of being, spiritual qualities and values into full view. When we speak the truth, you know, we make spirit visible. It's that creative process, right? We get a divine idea or we get that feeling in the gut, you know, that says something's not right. You ever get that? <laughs> and so we know we must say something. You know, we, we know we, must ha we have some truth that needs to be spoken. This is when we're stepping out into the wilderness that she talks about. Because we might say something that makes us stand completely alone from our people or from the people in the room. Or it might be that, you know, we're told to tow the company line or, or else you're not a team player. You know, this is one of the ways this hooey is set up. You're either for us or you're against us. These dichotomies, right? So part of the spiritual lens is to cut through the dichotomy and to say, wait a second, it's not just one or the other. You know, we set up all these, you know, after 9-11, it was set up this way. You either are for us and going to war or you're not united with, with our country, you know? It's like, well, isn't there some, somewhere in between? You know, you're either for gun ownership or you're against it. Isn't there some conversation to have in between, you know? So there's a lot of this kind of dichotomy that gets set up. You know, you're either, you're either part of this organization or, or you're not. And so there's, there's this difficulty for us to, and, and those, these are set up to silence dissent, right? These dichotomies are set up in desperate situations typically or in controlling situations, to say um, there's no room for debate or questions, and anybody you know, who, who says, I, I don't agree, is cast out, right? So it makes it really scary to be the one to speak up. But we must, right, when these things are set up. And how do we do it? Do you remember the story where Jesus is um, with a group of people and it's an angry mob and they're just carrying out the laws of the day. So the law of the day was if you committed adultery, you could be stoned to death. And it's like horrific to even think about that this could be so, but it is so, it was so. And so there was this woman who supposedly committed adultery. We don't know who she committed adultery with, but apparently she's, she's the guilty party. <laughs> and. Uh, there's all these people with big rocks, right? All, all these men are standing around these big rocks and they're ready to, to carry out the law. And Jesus kneels down and starts drawing in the sand. We never are told what he's drawing in the sand, but then he stands up and he says, whoever of you has not committed sin or broken the law, cast the first stone. Oh. <laughs> Everybody drops the rocks <laughs> and goes home. Everybody drops their hatred, maybe up-levels their consciousness and goes home. <laughs> but the way that that whole thing had been set up is this is the law and this is what we do. And what was Jesus doing anyway? Drawing in the sand. I think he was stalling. <laughs> I think he was taking a moment to pray, to drop inside and to say, Spirit, what is mine to do right now? 
how can I reach these people? What can I say? What will be the wisest thing that can be said, that will be understood and heard, that will break the action here? You know, whatever that prayer might have been, I think that was part of it. So that first step is always aligning with spirit, right? Dropping in, asking ourselves, something doesn't feel quite right here. I don't want to participate in this, but it's been set up as in either you're with us or you're against us, right? And if I go against, then I'm standing out here all by myself. And maybe I'll get stoned, metaphorically, of course. You know? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> oh yeah, I didn't even mean it that way. <laughs> Is that what some of you were laughing about? <laughs> I got to keep remembering I'm in California now. <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's always that question, you know, to align with spirit and find the truth. Allow ourselves to, it's always there, that wisdom is always there, trust it. Will it come out perfectly? Probably not. So what? <laughs> you know? I mean, we're, we're just, we're doing the best we can. We're being as authentic as we can. And when we do that, when we break silence, when we cut through all this hooey that's creating divisiveness and creating problems of all kinds, then we, ra we have an opportunity to raise consciousness, at the very least, stop a hateful act. And so by aligning, by dropping in, by taking a moment, and then having the courage to just stand up and speak our truth, and see how it lands. Jesus said, I came into this world, and reminds all of us, I was born into this world, I came into this world to testify to the truth. That's what it's all about. My whole life, my whole being, my actions and my words are about testifying to the truth. Now, sometimes we mean my truth and you, your truth, and yeah, that's all part, if it's authentic, that's all part of it. It's a, it's a relative part of this whole kind of continuum that we're talking about. There is that relative truth of my truth, your truth, what's in my heart, and there is that deeper, like underneath that very, um, maybe the back part of the heart or the underneath part of the heart, the very deep part that allows us to access spirit, that, that there's, a, there's a deeper truth here that's based in value, that's based in compassion, that's based in kindness, but also strength and a willing, and courage, a willingness to break silence where silence needs to be broken. You know in 2017, who time name person of the year? The silence breakers. The women who broke the silence in Hollywood, in government, in corporations, in the strawberry fields. The women who came forward and said, no more. Yeah. <laughs> and with that breaking of silence, we become a better people. We, become, we raise the level that we talked about last week. Remember that, that, that understanding, that line of human dignity. We raise it up so that it can meet this principle, this knowing of our innate divinity that says we are all worthy of respect and dignity. And it doesn't have to be an either or. You get to be an actress this way, you know? Or you get to be an actress because you have skill, <laughs> you know? So whatever it is that we are breaking up these truths, this, these, 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 this hooey, <laughs> to, to allow the truth to come forward the innate divinity and, and, and dignity that we all have. You know, we pay a, pro a high price when we remain silent. We pay a price individually with our integrity, and we pay the price collectively with this divisiveness that comes as a result of not being willing to stand, to take a stand. Martin Luther King Jr. said that there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And we all know where it gets to that point, right? Plato said, I'll take your silence as consent. <laughs> Ten days after that, meet that um, Harvey Weinstein thing was exposed and then more and more stuff became exposed, Alyssa Milano, who was an actress, um, took, took a cue from um, 
Tarana Burke in 2006 who started the Me Too idea, but it didn't take off then. It wasn't time, right? It was a precursor to another time when the time was right. So Alyssa Milano didn't know. She just tweeted out, if you've ever been sexually harassed or uh, assaulted, just respond to this tweet with Me Too. And she went to bed, and when she woke up, 50,000 people had responded, and a movement was born. Timing is a part of it, right? We don't always know the divine timing. All we know is what's in our hearts and in our guts <laughs> to say enough of whatever or this is the truth, which is one and the same, really, because a truth emerges when we stop something that isn't true. You know, and it happens, it's not just about starting movements and all this, because sometimes that can be a little overwhelming to come Sunday and then walk out and go, okay, well, I'm not Martin Luther King, and I'm probably not going to start a movement tomorrow, but what about at home? <laughs> you know, what about all the ways that in my daily life that I can practice these principles? You know, there was a couple that was having uh, an argument, and they went into silent treatment all day long. Anybody ever go, you know, it was, it was this kind of experience all day long, you know? passing each other, not looking, you know, <laughs> this kind of stuff. So they get, they get to the evening, you know, it's still, they're still not talking. They didn't let, they let the sun go down on their anger, you know, that, that's, that old adage, that really works. Don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger, you know. But they did. So he's laying in bed and he realizes this, his wife is falling asleep. Oh my gosh, I've got an early flight tomorrow morning. Now this guy is a sleeper, so he sleeps through his alarm and usually his wife will wake him up. She's like, what am I going to do, you know? <laughs> so he decides that the best thing I can do is write a note, and I'll put it right where she'll see it. I know absolutely she'll see it when she wakes up. So he writes, please wake me up at 5 a.m. on a little post-it note right where he knows she'll see it. So he wakes up in the morning. The sunlight's already coming in, really bright in the room. It's 8.15 a.m., missed his flight. And he's like, oh, no, she didn't wake me up. And he rolls over, and there's this little papery thing behind his head. And he pulls out, and it's a note. And it says, it's 5 a.m., wake up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the silent treatment will do for you. <laughs> All right, somebody's got to have the courage to break the silence and speak the truth. Honey, my feelings are hurt. You could start there. And then whatever else needs to come from that truth, right? So speaking the truth in all these ways, small and big, makes a big difference in our world. It can be a route to healing. You know, and we can be kind about it. In fact, the Buddhist teachings give us in skillful speech or mindful speech Three questions to ask. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? So as we're considering, do I want to say this? We can say to ourselves, is it true? Yeah, it's true. It needs to be spoken. Is it kind? Hmm, how can I say it in a kind way? Is it necessary? Yeah, I got to say it. <laughs> you know, so that we can kind of use that as our, our form or our our um, guideline before we speak and how we speak these truths. But we don't want to allow things to go on that violate human dignity and divinity at the very least, right? We want to break the silence on those. And when we speak those truths, allow spirit to become visible. Allow that creative process to happen where the ideas get formed into words and trust that they come from spirit and, and that spiritual offering is put out into the world. Let me offer you this truth with compassion. Let me offer you this truth that will raise up all of our consciousness. Let me offer you this truth, this wisdom that is coming through me. We don't have to say all that, but that is a part of our understanding of what is being offered. You know, and, and be civil, right? This is a big part of, of this chapter in, in the book that we're working with is speak truth to Hui and, and be civil about it, you know? So what does that mean, to be civil, too? Boy, there's a lot to work with here, right? Cassandra Donkey and Thomas Spaeth, the founders of the Institute for Civility and Government, give this definition of civility, and Dr. Brown says, 
when she does her research, all these people that she interviews have basically given her the same definition of what it means to be civil. And so it is civility is claiming and caring for one's identity, needs, and beliefs without degrading someone else's in the process. Civility is the hard work of staying present, even with those with whom we have deep-rooted or fierce disagreement. That is hard work, isn't it, sometimes? To stay really present, to not try to skirt around the conversation, dismiss the conversation, end the conversation, you know, and, and, and just remain silent. But to, to know where that line is for you, where your human dignity, or you feel like, uh, you know, you're being attacked, where you have to just say, no, I'm not having this conversation anymore, or, or here's another way we could go about this, you know? So how can we stay really present, really present, bring up that, that, the full spirit to listen and to know when, when and what to say, to stay, stay with it as long as we can stay with it, in other words, until we really feel like, oh, I have to shake the dust off my sandals and move on. <laughs> this isn't working right now. So, you know, we get it a little confused, though, this thing about speaking truth and being courageous. And here's an example in the book that I want to share with you. She talks about a man in his 20s who's driving home to see his father. And this is especially cast in the idea of this deep-rooted kind of disagreement, you know. The, the young man and his father have, have ongoing had these disagreements, you know. And so they get there, he gets there, and he's talking to his dad in the kitchen, and he says, hey, dad, how are your new neighbors? And his father says, oh, we really like them. We've had them over for dinner a couple times, and we've become friends, and they're actually making us dinner next week. They're oriental, and she's going to make her special dumplings. So mom is really looking forward to it. And the young man just rips right into his father. Oriental? Are you kidding me, dad? Racist much? He says, that is so embarrassing, dad. Is there a place on the planet called the Orient? Ugh. Oh. Gosh, and, and so rather than engaging, his father just drops his head and like looks at the floor. And when he finally looks up, he looks up teary-eyed, and he says, I'm sorry, son. I don't know what it is that I've done to make you so angry. It doesn't seem like I can do anything right. Nothing's good enough. And then they're just kind of quiet for a while. And then his father says, you know, I'd stick around to let you tell me more about what a jerk I am, but I need to pick up uh, my neighbor's husband, you know, the ones I supposedly hate, because he had cataract surgery and she doesn't drive. So I need to go now. And during this interview with Dr. Brown, the young man said, I didn't know what to do or say, so I just walked out and left. He didn't know how to be civil <laughs> for whatever reasons, because maybe there was deep-rooted disagreements or whatever it was, was for them. <clears throat> but let's not be confu confuse these things, because being civil includes being kind and compassionate. But it's not about necessarily being really nice in the way that we've understand niceness in our culture. Kelly Bryson wrote a book called Don't Be Nice, Be Real. And he says that we have a hereditary disease called nicitis. <laughs> and he said, and that actually breeds, you know, it's, it's kind of a really a cruelty in which we breed our children and we raise our children to, to be nice girls and nice boys, right? <clears throat> and by doing so, that means that they're quiet and controlled. <laughs> And when we do that to people, we kind of break the little spirits, right? <laughs> and, then, and then those individuals, this training kind of breeds over and it breeds this sort of depressed culture that doesn't, that life force is drained out, right? The passion is gone because we have to fit in. It's a culture of fitting in and avoiding conflict out of this idea of being nice. But that's not the truth. <laughs> That's not the authentic truth of spirit. 
If Jesus and Buddha were all worried about being nice all the time, we wouldn't have the movements that we had in their names or all the other spiritual masters, right? Because there's a time to be strong and courageous and clear, and that is the most loving thing to do, to break the silence in these situations. So Kelly Bryson in this book goes on to tell a story about how a woman wants to read her story in a group. She says, oh, would anybody mind if I read my story? And the group says, well, how long is the story? Because we want to have time to socialize tonight instead of just saying yes, right? And if it's a couple pages, it's okay, but otherwise, no. And he says, how often do we just say yes, even though we mean no, because we think it's nice? And instead, those same people who say, yes, you can read your story, are the same people who are coughing and fidgeting and whispering to their neighbor while the person is reading the story, right? He says that people in nice cultures let themselves be oppressed by someone's request and then blame that someone for not psychically knowing that yes meant no. <laughs> Again, Jesus, let your yea be yea and your no be no. Be clear. Those who set clear boundaries, and this is also found in Dr. Brown's research, those who set the clearest boundaries are the ones who are perceived as the most trustworthy. Because if our boundaries are clear, then people know where things are, where things sit with us. And they can, they can feel like they can trust us. If we're all like wishy-washy nice all the time in the way that he's talking about it, it, it doesn't feel very good. It doesn't feel very trusting for somebody to say yes and then roll their eyes while you're doing the thing that you just gave permission for them to do. You know, So this is a part of it too, learning how to show up, how we show up with each other, and how we speak to one another. Aligning with spirit first is always the first step. You know, taking a moment, drawing in the sand, or taking a moment just to breathe into the truth that is within us, you know, to access that heart wisdom, to know that there is intuition and wisdom within us that will say, speak now or speak this, or open the conversation and see where it goes. Trust it, break the silence, have the courage to be the one to break the silence and see what happens. And then be compassionate and courageous as we move through it, compassionate with ourselves as well. You know, the scariest thing when we come to the end of our lives is asking these questions, you know, did I speak the truth? Much scarier than braving the wilderness during our lives is to come to an end of our lives full of regrets. I didn't tell the truth. <laughs> I wasn't authentic. I wasn't fully clear. I didn't speak to that thing that happened that could have saved, even saved lives or helped lives. You know, so it's finding the, that, that line that we're walking of, human dignity and divinity and, and raising it up and having the courage because the truth be told when we step out and stand alone it often isn't for very long before we have 50,000 people before behind us like Alyssa Milano did it just takes that first person to say I'll do it <laughs> I'll speak the truth I'll be true to my own being my own body wisdom that's telling me, my own intuition, my spirit. And I'll come forward with that truth so that I'm not regretting, that I know that I played full out, that I engaged fully, and that I gave of myself by speaking up and knowing that all voices matter. Do you really know that? Do you know that your voice matters? Your voice matters just as much as anybody else's. We all have different roles and responsibilities in this world, but that doesn't make us more powerful than one another. We all have equal power. We all have the equality of spirit within us. And that is enough power to change, overchange anything, to cut through any kind of hooey and bring forth the light and the truth of who we are and what we want to be as a society together. So let's close out with this affirmation and bring this into our week 
to stand in our spiritual authority with kindness. Together, I speak the truth with spiritual authority and kindness. And so it is. Thank you.